You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter M. Lemwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. Today on Black Power Talks, we discuss African cultural revolution, specifically the Black Arts Movement. The Black Arts Movement was a cultural uprising in the African community during the Black Revolution of the 1960s. Inside and outside the United States, there was an explosion of African artists creating poetry, music, books, and other artistic works, which were centered around Black people, Black pride, and the pursuit of Black power, African independence. The Black Arts Movement has been described as the cultural arm of the Black Revolution of the 60s. It was a direct response to the anti-colonial struggles for liberation being waged by African people all around the world. This was the case because art imitates life. The desires of the masses of the people will always, always be reflected in the art that we produce during that period. As Kwame Nkrumah, Malcolm X, Che Guevara, Fred Hampton, Patrice Lumumba, Huey Newton, and many of our martyrs were leading struggles for independence. Nina Simone was singing Young, Gifted, and Black, and James Brown was singing Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. The Black Arts Movement played a critical role in raising the consciousness of African people and articulating our demand for African liberation. Today, we're excited to welcome one of the most powerful cultural voices of the African Liberation Movement, Brother Abiy Odun Oyewole. Abiy Odun is one of the founders of The Last Poets and penned some of the most widely known works such as New York, New York and When the Revolution Comes. He's one of the original MCs, has embodied hip hop in its most raw and authentic form, and his influence is felt throughout the culture today. Well, who will Brother Abiy Odun want to welcome you onto the show today? Yes, um, what the brother was saying about the Black Power Movement was very true. Matter of fact, Kwame Ture was a very dear friend of mine, um, and I miss the brother because he was brilliant, and he and he gave us a line that we should keep in the forefront of our heads all the time. He said, we must have an undying love for our people. Yes. And if that was the case, we wouldn't see all these shootings, these at random shootings all over the country because there's a lot of pent up emotion and a lot of us are still suffering from self-hatred. And consequently, we, we execute each other because of our mm-hmm. personal issues with ourselves. So the movement is something that should be ongoing. The one thing that the last post tried to do, if you notice on the very first album, um, we, we dealt with the whole concept of niggas, but we weren't telling folks to become niggas. We were trying to say that that's the thing you don't want to be because that is the nigger was was equivalent to the mule, an animal that was created from putting a horse with a donkey. So mm-hmm. when you got an African that's being ruled and being uh, um uh, should I say, branded by a white man, you end up having a nigger. And that, and they consider the nigger, the, the pe- people don't realize it, but the whole concept of nigger came from the fact that this mule didn't have a nickname. 
So that was the first one that got the name nigger. And how black man ended up getting that word and put us assigned to him is because what we had in common with the mule was that we were both property of the master, so to speak. And but then black folks have a phenomenal way of flipping everything. We're the only people on the planet that can take a, a perfectly negative word and make it, make it perfectly positive. No one in the world has that ability but us. So you can take a word like bad and make it wonderful. Take a word like dope and make it just, just fabulous. I mean, and then we take the word nigger and we've turned, we've turned, actually we've turned doo-doo into meatloaf because you've got folks that are using the word like it's okay, like it's a, and, and in our own circles, we can say it with a certain tone that sounds endearing. And of course, if the attitude or the, the participation at that moment is not positive, we can say it in a way that makes it sound unwanted. So we have tone in our language. We're sound tolerance. We're people who depend on sound more than we do on words. And certain words represent sounds that we like and we play on them. The last poets, we tried to clean up our own mess in our own community and de Black folks so that we could really all be Black and together and have that solidarity that we talked about. We are still in need of that, very much so. Right now, there's a whole, as a campaign to integrate us by any means necessary. White folks realize they're dying and they're going out of their way to connect with Black people. So you can't even see a commercial on television that doesn't show black and white together. And the black love and black hopes and dreams are fading into, into grayness, into whiteness, because we are still here doing what we were brought here to do. And we don't and we don't need to misunderstand that. We were brought here to raise a bunch of children. Mm. And that's what we're still doing. Wow. Yeah. You, you really got us started with that one. And just the idea that, like you said, to denigrify or, you know, cause you know, the sort of it's time for, 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 for ends to die and, 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 and black folks to take over, you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 we also write, I write for the Burnisburg newspaper and one of the covers for the Burnisburg newspaper uh, in the late sixties, early seventies, uh, had an African man emerging from, uh, you know, a stereotypical uh, uh, a coon of some sort character, yeah, right. right? You know, I've seen it, that. It, it, yeah, and it says yeah. inside every inside every coon is is an African waiting to get free. Yes, yes, like yes. That. And yeah. that's what we want to bring out because, see, I know, and I'm sure you do too. I'm aware of the magnificence of my people. There yeah. is no. There is nobody more magnificent than us. Yeah, I mean, you, you give us nothing and we turn nothing into everything, not just something, but it becomes the, the primary source of life. We have that ability. We create magic with our language. We create magic with whatever you give us, whatever we have in our hands, whatever we have in our minds. We are phenomenal. And the brilliance of us is something I want to see. You see, it says Tyler Perry has a, Films a, a, a state of the arts studio in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and I've seen pictures on TV. It looks like it covers about two or three blocks. It's ridiculous. I'm waiting for Tyler Perry to do something that's not a nigga movie. I want to see a movie about black power. I want to see a movie showing the love that we have shared with each other, the glory of our lives. I don't want to see all the the ugly stuff that we do. We know that the ugly happens. Ugly gonna be here for a long time, but we are absolutely beautiful. And we've shown the beautiful side. Unfortunately, it's gone to support others who don't feel or think like we think. And they grand on our joy, on our beauty. They take our slap uh, high fives and use them to grandize themselves, to, to glorify who they are. And when they're out to give us that, we're the creators of life on so many levels. But we don't give ourselves the respect or the courage to continue to move forward and protect what we create as we should. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, thanks for that. Because uh, as we get started, you know, I wanna talk about, uh, you know, the creation of The Last Poets, uh, the, um, you know, revolutionary uh, African um, art uh, organization. I mean, I think it's really important to underscore uh, it, just not as a group, but really as a revolutionary formation. 
uh, absolutely uh, of sorts you know uh, of which uh, the voice was the weapon and if the voice was not the web a weapon then they would not have banned drums on uh slave plantations they would not right. have taken our tongue away from us but even when they did take our tongue away from us uh, africans had another language which you speak of because uh maya angelou speaks of when she went to west africa she learned of something that the the the, the tukler over there called the uh, Leleng Dus, or the sweet language, a way through which Africans speak uh, in an African language, even if we're not, you know, just by, 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 by tone. She says, you, right. know, um, you know, white folks say, hi, how are you? And black folks say, hey, how are you doing, right? And so there's a way through which Afri you can, you, it, Africans speak and see the world and, and, and it's connected to, 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 to life and, and the production of life and 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 which in its essence is sort of an anti-colonial. So let me ask you this. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated April right. 4th, uh, 1968. This is uh, 54 years ago, um, right. we, uh, last week, as part mm -hmm. of the U.S. counterinsurgency against the Black Revolution of the 1960s, which killed and jailed so many leaders. Right. Uh, and the last post was actually formed May 19th, 1968, right. which was Malcolm's birthday. So you've spoken about how the assassination of Dr. King was a pivotal moment for you, and it was a driving force behind the creation of The Last Poet. So can you speak to that a little bit and how right. that time influenced the sound and the message of The Last Poets? Yes. Well, my folks, my, the, my mother and father who, who raised me in Queens, my mother in particular loved Dr. King. I remember she had such love for Dr. King until in 63 when he did the, the, the I Have a Dream speech in Washington. She had me put my hand on the TV like it was going to give me some power <laughs> that we could get from this man talking. But he was revered by our people. I could never, my father wasn't so keen. He liked Dr. King, but he didn't like the idea that Dr. King was talking about turning the other cheek. Because my father was coming from, my father's from Savannah, Georgia, and his whole thing was a he said, boy, if somebody put their hands on you, I don't want you hitting them back. I want you to break their hand. So when they look at it in the cast, they'll know why they shouldn't touch you. So I I was never a fighter. But if you bothered me, I'd just panic. I'd go crazy because I didn't want my father beating my butt. So I would just about kill you. You don't mess with nobody that don't fight. You leave those people alone. So I understood the idea that you can't have people just touching you if you don't want them to. And you have to set a tone. You have to set a, send a message. So King was talking about nonviolence and but white folks could smack you and you just turn the cheek and sing, we shall overcome. But my mother, she revered him. And consequently, I also thought Dr. King was very important. He was our leader. And when they killed him, I, and I'm sure millions of other black folks felt offended. I was totally offended. A year before he was killed, I was working I was a freshman, I was 17, I was working for an anti-poverty program and I met a guy named David Nelson. David Nelson was older, about eight, nine years older than me, and he mm -hmm. ran the anti-poverty program. And he spoke about kept setting up a group, a collective of poets to like give an example to black people as to how much we needed to unify. And he said, poets usually, they, they usually ride solo. They don't hang out in groups. Poets can be reclusive. They can go up into the woods by themselves and talk to trees and stuff. The reality is, if we bring some poets together from different walks of life, and we're on the stage dealing with the same issues, maybe Black folks can see that as an example of what we should all become. So you're a Christian, I'm a Muslim, but we got the same foot on our necks. So that was an idea. When they killed Dr. King, I honestly wanted to become a serial killer. I was ready to get a gun, go up on a roof, and just shoot white folks at random. I thought that they were all evil because King was talking about love and peace and he was shot down like a dog. And it just, it just, it, it tore me apart. I couldn't believe it. And, and black folks were crying all over the place. But then David said to me, listen, I put your name and my name and this other guy I met, I put our names on a list to read poetry at Mount Mars Park for Malcolm X's birthday. When I heard that the first time I was excited because I'm going to be a part now of the next movement, which was coming out of the civil rights movement. The Black Power movement was inevitable. That was the next step because 
They killed civil rights when they killed Dr. King. So now we're trying to deal with black power, which was it made more sense to me than anything because I was raised like a black power child. My father believed that you should have your own. We always had food stored up in freezers. They could have gone on strike from the store. I would have eaten very well because my father believed in, in maintaining and having having enough to take care of us no matter what. He, he taught me how to do things. If my car broke down, we didn't call a mechanic. We fixed it ourselves. Mm. If we needed something built, we built it ourselves. He taught me how to be self-reliant. He taught me how to be self-determined. He gave me all of those tools. I hated it. I hated him because he worked all the damn time. I wanted to play. I wanted to be a child. But my father gave me the tools of a man. And I'm living that today. And I'm, I'm, I am have to say, of all the men in my life, he was the most important because he helped make me who I am. He employed discipline, something that many of us just kicked to the curb. So I learned how to be a disciplined person. I learned how to take care of my life. I learned how to enjoy some of the fruits of my labor because labor is important and you truly enjoy it if you work for it. So I got to that. So black power was perfect. The idea that we want to be black and have power over our lives made all the sense of the world. But at the same time, I'm going to read poetry in Harlem. Man, that scared the hell out of me. Harlem is like the Apollo. You go on stage and don't do well. Sam might come and snatch you off. And that would be the end of your whole life. So I, I was a little nervous. So I came to Harlem. I walked around. And I started listening to the people. That's when I realized that our poetry comes from the people. We ain't got to sit down and create something. Walk around. Listen to Black folks. We are poetic. We're poetic in the way we talk. And the way we walk, how we treat each other, our hand gestures. If you can't hear what we say, we give you a whole story in our body movements. We are poetic to the max. The very Our very existence on this planet must entertain Mother Nature because we have dance steps in our movements and no matter what we are doing. So it became significant to me that my poetry would come directly out of the mouths and the thoughts and feelings of black folks. So my very first poem, which was entitled, What Is Your Thing, Brother? came from one of the songs that was out at the time and much of our songs always mirror what we're, what we're going through. The song at the time was, It's Your Thing, Do What You Want to Do. I think the Ozzy Brothers were the uh, authors of that. So I wrote a poem, it, What Is Your Thing, Brother? Is it a black thing? Will it save black women and children? Will it build a black nation? And I was deeply into the whole nationalist concept because I felt that we were the ones who had been disenfranchised. We were not allowed to have to enjoy the so-called uh, beautiful America that some people had the, the thrill of enjoying. So I was very pleased with the fact that I had tapped onto the pulse of my folks by listening to my people. And the whole movement of our whole public em emphasis was that we wanted to extract the niggers out of Black folks so that we could actually be together as black people and rely on each other, look forward to accomplishing what we need to accomplish, developing projects that would work and be our own salvation. You know, we continue to look around waiting for Jesus to come. We are Jesus. We are our own salvation. We are the only, we are everything that we've been looking for. We have it within us. And the uh, idea of the poets was if we could clean house, if you get rid of all the nasty stuff inside of you, and let that black person emerge, you might be surprised at the greatness that you have within and you can put it on exhibit and you can be proud of yourself. So that was our mission. Unfortunately, a lot of the hip hop artists who have listened to us over the years, they got stuck when they heard the word nigga. They didn't go no further than that. Cause I've had, I've talked with Chuck D, I've spoken with a lot of folks and they say, we all use nigga a lot. Yeah, but we were, we were saying that not to be a nigga. But we got to be careful. A lot of times when we want to get rid of something, we give it much more promotion by saying it so many times. And after a while, it becomes the encompassing fact. And we don't get rid of it. We actually multiply it and give it more life. So if we want to get rid of something, we're going to have to find a way to eliminate even using the sound of it. I know what we have done, how we flip things, how we make things good out of something that was considered negative. But... The last poets came on the heels of the fact that, matter of fact, a, a few, not long ago, Coco Seeley, a brother, a South African poet from South Africa, is uh, the name itself was gleaned from a poem 
about the conditions that Africans had to go through in South Africa. The mm. poet's name was Capesi Cocosili. Yeah, Kippy, Kippy, right, Kippy right. Cocosili. He he taught at UCLA, and that's that's Earl Sweatshirt's dad. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, uh, I think that that's absolutely important. I know we're going in a different direction, but this is important because part of the thing is that time kind of allows for us to understand uh, the creation of the last poets, but in many yeah. ways with this connection to Kippy, Cogastilli, they were part of something called the Sophia Town Renaissance. Uh, right. Because in the 1950s, you know, Sophia Town was sort of like a Harlem of Johannesburg. Right, and, right. And, and it was a cultural art district. And what they did when they wanted to destroy the political movement there uh, that was brewing up for black consciousness, they destroyed Sophia Town. They literally raised it. They turned it into uh, a white suburb of sorts and, and pushed Africans further out into uh, Soweto, the southwestern uh, townships and things like that. And, and doesn't, that, doesn't that pattern sound familiar, brother? Right. It, 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 exactly. It's, it's, it's the exact right. same thing because how they black, push black the Wall push. Street. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so, so I think that you offer a different sort of um, uh, uh, what we would say academia, like right? temporalization, but sort of like a time setting to let us understand that. Look, you know, the Black Arts Movement uh, was a product, of course, of the late sixties, but it's also connected to this sort of uh, cultural resistance amongst African people, uh, and, and it was a part of international cultural resistance. Because, like you said, Kippy and them uh, were, were important. They were living in uh, New York. Some of them were living in New York. Some of them right. were living in in, uh, in Los Angeles. Because after the Sharpeville massacre, uh, you know, a lot of the artists, because they were artists, were able to leave and uh -huh. stuff like that. But, you know, they came and salute to Kippy, salute to Mary McKeeb and all them. They came and touched down in the hood and and and, and united with the Africans here and played right. such an important role. Where I'm from, Master Kayla yeah. played an important role uh, as well. So, so yeah, I'm happy you said that. We we were going right. to talk about that. Well, that yeah. well, he was the inspiration for us calling ourselves the last ones because of a poem that he, uh, it was actually the last part of a poem that he had written called Twelve to Walk in the Sun. And it deals directly with what you just said. And it, and, and it says, this wind you hear is a birth of memory. When the moment hatches in time's womb, there will be no art talk. The only poem you will hear will be the spear point pivoted into the punctured marrow of the villain yeah. yes. and the timeless native sun dancing like crazy to retrieve rhythms of desire fading into memory. And David Nelson added, therefore, we are the last poets of the world. You know, so like when you mentioned the fact that the last poets is not just the name of a group, but it's a whole philosophy. And you said that you kind of hinted to that earlier. That's the absolute truth. Um, Gil Scott, his last year before he, he left us, we had a gig together, the last poets and Gil Scott Heron at Carter Baron Amphitheater in Washington, D.C. And the paparazzi was interviewing both he and I. And he first of all, he started by saying, Gil, I got Abi Odun here. He's the founding member of the Last Poets. Tell us, are you a Last Poet? And Gil said, yeah, I'm a Last Poet. Then he looked at me and I said, yes, he's a Last Poet. Ain't got nothing to do with the fact that he's not traveling with the group right, called the Last right, Poets. Right. It's his philosophy. What he says is Last Poet material. Because what we're saying is that this is the final call. We're giving you a message that you need to take notice of and get on board with because change is going to take place. Of course, we know change takes a long, takes time, and it's going to have to be thorough in order for it to be significant. But it's about understanding that we have poets, we have people who are trying to motivate and inspire the change that we would like to see. Right on, right on. Yeah, I really appreciate that answer, brother. Um you know, just the purpose of the last poets and just the mission that, that you all were carrying out. And just, you know, just you going into how the assassination of MLK really just kind of thrusted a lot of African people into another phase of, of the struggle, you know. And, you know, we know that the murder of King and so many of other leaders was connected to the uh, the counterinsurgency. And, and you know, I know one weapon of, of the counterinsurgency was them pouring drugs into our community and yes making, yes and making it so 
making us so many of our people, you know, we're too hooked on the stuff to be able to, to fight for our own liberation. Exactly. And, and, you know, I see this theme of drugs being poured in our community and the impact it had on our people in a lot of the last poet's records. But I know a few that always uh, kind of resonated with me, especially were OD, Jones coming down. Right. And, and, and two little boys. Yes. And, me, and two little boys are something that I literally saw take place in Sylvia's restaurant. I, wow. I mean, I mean, and, and and the thing about it, and God rest Sylvia's soul, she, I saw these kids coming in and they ordered a big old, like it was a Thanksgiving dinner and they ate like they hadn't eaten for a long time. And then they started looking around and I started getting suspicious. And I said, these boys are up to no good. And sure enough, they got up when they thought the coast was clear and started heading out the door. And I chased them. And Sylvia stopped me and said, look, those are two of our junky babies. I'm mm. just glad they got something to eat. And I said, I hope you got a pen and a pad. And I wrote that piece right in her place because it happened right before my eyes. I mean, but that's what we got to do. We have to always connect the dots, always recognize what we do to help save our people because many of us have been duped or as Malcolm said, bamboozled, hoodwink, all kinds of stuff. And yeah. they've always got something run to do that to us. Yeah, run them up. And I love what Malcolm, what, what Spike did at the end. Matter of fact, that may have been the most impacting thing he did with the movie Malcolm. When he had the kids come on the screen at the end and say, I am Malcolm, because like you mentioned, they've killed all our leaders. They keep killing them. Every chance they get, they find another person to kill that's got influence. If we take on the message that our leaders or the folks are the same things that we need to hear, Say, if we just take that, if we hear what they say and incorporate what they say, they cannot kill our leaders because they live inside of us. Uh, who, Brother Abiel Doom, just while yep. you're on that note, you know, Tony K. Bambara in like 1970, she put out this anthology called Rule of My Black, Love, yes. Well, well, no, The Black Woman, that one. Oh, yeah, The Black Woman. I know, I know Tony. And, 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 and there's an excellent essay that ends the book it's called are the revolutionary techniques employed in the battle of algiers applicable to harlem by francie covington mm, and something man. that kind of stands out to me about that is that what she actually says is if we're going to basically make this revolution we got to start by getting these pushes off our block because how exactly. are we going exactly how are we going to take how are we going to take out the government, if we can't stop the mafia from pushing dope in our neighborhood, right. there you go, and right. stuff like that. So, so, so I found that to be an excellent essay coming from the poetic mind of the African woman, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, which really even shows us why African women must lead. But what, what do you think about that? Because, like, it's not a coincidence that that essay comes out right when your album drops. Right. Listen, The Battle of Algiers is one of the most impacting movies I've ever, ever seen. I was totally, what. matter of fact, the night that I saw The Battle of Algiers, I saw right after that, I went to a Nina Simone concert. <laughs> Man, that's, that's like a double whammy. I mean, because The Battle of Algiers, is, if, if folks are not familiar with that, they should find a way to Google it up on their gadget or whatever, but they need to check it out. Because, yes, it was about cleaning house. We cannot wage war against our enemies if we are fighting amongst ourselves. If we are killing each other over time, what is there to wage a war for? I, I, I want us to main, I want us to recognize that we are sacred to one another, and I want to fight for that sacredness within us that we, that's being trampled upon. I want us to see the beauty of who we are and fight for that beauty and protect it. And we, but in order for us to be able to do that. We've all got to agree that there is beauty. We've all got to agree that there's something sacred. And that's what's missing when you deal with this disparity within the community. We have to try our very best to clean up the community. Battle of Algiers does that. They gave the pimps a couple of weeks to get the hose off the street. They gave the, the, the pushers a couple of weeks to stop selling their drugs. And they said, that's, that's, this is the only chance, we, this is the only message we got for you all when they came back. They shot them all down because they would have no value to the revolutionary movement. Mm. I say that's basically what the last post is about. We're not going to use guns to shoot you down. We're going to use our words. Our words are bullets. 
that will shoot you down. And you will feel it because of the way we're saying it. We're not going to say it in flowery tones. We're coming at you with the funk straight ahead, straight to your heart, because we need to make a change and we need you to participate. Right, right. Y'all are taking back the corners as revolutionary right. spaces. Right. And because you're from, or at least you were born in Cincinnati, Ohio. And yes, Cincinnati I was born there. played an important place in the African liberation struggle. It always has. It's been kind of overlooked from Cincinnati to Dayton. I mean, it's something about that area. Maybe it's in the water or the food or <laughs> because funk came out of there. Uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, boop, boop. Uh, like Askia was was from Dayton. I mean, yep. uh, like like it's so much stuff that came out of that my, Miami River Valley area and stuff like that. But I think taking back the corners for as a revolutionary space is so is so important. You know, it's not a coincidence that uh, during the time of slavery and Jim Crow, just brother standing on the corner was politicized. You know what I mean? Right. It, it was, uh -huh. it, it, you know, it was brothers. It couldn't be more than two folks standing together without white folks having to be present. So so I think that, you know, what you're talking about is really taking back these spaces of African political production and giving it back to the revolutionaries, giving it back to the African working class. Right, right. Matter of fact, Umar Benassar, my partner, would love to hear what you just said because he's doing a very epic piece called Midwestern Funk to, and to connect the dots with the funk and Africa and, and how the funk has its own revolutionary tale to tell. So as we touched on earlier, through the counterinsurgency, many of our revolutionary leaders were killed, jailed, or exiled. And our revolutionary movement of the 60s was set back significantly. Right. In the absence of our revolutionary leaders, various sellouts and puppets were put out and presented to us as leaders, even though they all served the status quo. I think you really sum this up in your quote. In the absence of a movement, the circus comes to town. Can yes. you explain this for us from well, your in, perspective? Well, first of all, we're dealing with, a, with children here. I mean, we give this white boy all kinds of credit by calling him a supremacist and a racist and all that. And all that's true. But the basics of his existence is that of a child. He is immature. He's a child. And he really basically brought us here, as Fannie Lou Hamer made it clear to me in a personal conversation we had. He says, uh, they have all those negative things happening. And yes, we know that. They've provided the world with diseases and, and wars every 10 years uh, so often. But the truth of the matter is they're bad children. And they really brought us here to raise them. So we have to understand our position here and their position. Um, you know, when when I talk about uh, in the absence of a movement, we need a movement to like get us on the same page. A lot of folks, uh, you know, do whatever they feel like doing. They don't have no regard for what's happening in the world around them. They just have their own personal agenda. When you're dealing with a movement, it kind of sets the tone, and you just can't be just being goosey loosey, you've got to think about the fact that this is going on right now, and you got a lot of folks are gonna look at you cockeyed if you act stupid. So you try to get on the same page. So a movement is important. But now, if the movement is not happening, the circus is gonna take over because that's what children do. They they want to go to the circus. They want to see the clown show. They want to see the animals dance for them. They wanna they want to be entertained over time. And we have black folks who are willingly standing online, ready to be entertainers, ready to be clowns, ready to continue to, to exercise our phenomenal ability to do whatever is available in a way that no one else can do it. And then other folks will capitalize. I mean, we're looking at football. Football is, is primarily about 80% of the players are black and the owners are all white and they are sitting back collecting major, major money watching brothers act out on a field and they will put in front of you a, a coach and GM will be white because that's empowering them. Those folks make the last decisions, but they can't catch no football. They can't run with no football, but yet they were in charge of the game itself. That, and, that, and that's nothing but another show. It's a circus. I love basketball. I used to live and breathe basketball. I still watch it. I don't play like I used to, but I mean, I played it like religiously and 
that's another show. We're putting on shows constantly and we and we get serious about it. And they got how many talk shows on TV to talk about these different sports. All of this is just it's a game. Those are, those are big old adult video games that we play. And uh, and and yet in the midst of all of this, you got young black men are still being shot down in the street by police, male and female cops. You still got all we got kids who are totally uh, uh, misguided, unsettled souls running around with guns, shooting at anybody in their path. It doesn't matter who gets hit. A kid, a, a baby might get hit. An elderly sister or brother might get killed. They don't shoot them down to shoot straight. And, and, and if they're shooting just a love scene, it's out of order. The fact of the matter is that the circus can be a very dangerous place as well. So yes, in the absence of a movement, the circus comes to town, but the circus is tragic. The circus is not a place for cotton candy and happy smiles. It's a place where blood is being poured into mm. the land unnecessarily. It's a place where slaughters are going on repeatedly. And it's, it's painful to be a part of the circus that we're in. Well, well, this is absolutely important. I mean, I'm really grateful for this because as African internationalists, we define racism as the ideological justification for colonialism. And uh-huh. what happens is that uh, we can talk about the human circuses that was used at the turn of the 20th century to justify the colonization of Africa, in which they right. literally literally put babies on zoos. I mean, those human exhibits, they call them dioramas, in which they will put humans inside the earliest, some of the earliest of which was the sister uh, Sarah Bartman from, yes. uh, from, 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 from South Africa. She was a part of the, uh, I think it was a, a Barnum and Bailey Circus. Uh, P.T. Barnum was his name. And then also during the anti-slavery movement, it's not a coincidence that we talked about Cincinnati. T.D. Rice was from Cincinnati. Right. And that at the exact same time that Africans are traveling around as almost itinerant ministers of sorts, uh, speaking uh-huh. the gospel of anti-slavery, you got the minstrel shows playing the right. exact same right. arenas, right. playing the exact same arenas. So if it's a Saturday and you're going to come to talk about anti-slavery, but the Friday before the minstrel show was there and people <laughs> hugging it up at blackface, you know, there was a counter-revolutionary art movement. So if they can use art for counter-revolutionary purposes, then we got to be able to use it for revolutionary purposes. Absolutely. That's, that's you see that's what that's why I got friends who are holding out on Tyler Perry. I I'm always giving him grief and I got a sister priest says, "Give him a chance. He's going to do something." I I hope he does. He's got the state of the art studio and we we are affected by images. This country is image crazy. And you put an image on the screen and lord knows it's going to be copied overnight. I mean, we can produce images to show the, the greatness of us, the beauty of us, easily. And, 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 and you still keep your funk and your sassiness, all that, the, all the little spicy things that you like to see. Hey, you ain't got to lose that. But highlight the goodness, the, the, the magnificence, the intelligence, and stop playing on that dumb stuff that the other so-called society likes to see. I mean, it, it's about, like I always say, when they give us an Oscar, they usually do it like they're saying to you in so many words, this is what we want you to do. Now they right. gave they gave um, Will Smith an Oscar for for uh, Richard. That was unique. But then this is the first time they've had a black man that produced the whole Oscar setting. Of course, it was toppled a bit by a nigger episode between Will and um, Chris Rock. <laughs> But, 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 <laughs> hey, you but, know what? I was actually thinking, should we go there this episode? And I said, oh man, it's inevitable that this was going to come. Well, well, you yeah, know, it's a, part, it's, it's a part of the whole scenario. I mean, when you look at it, it's not isolated, it's a part of the entire scenario. They were characters of a nigga show, period. I mean, they don't even have to be called Chris Rock and Will Smith. <clears throat> we have this happening too often, too many times, too many places. It just this is just happened to be on national television, but maybe. A uh, hundred million people were watching, <laughs> and that's not cool at all. We know that, but the reality is that that does happen, and 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 it's and it's important that we realize that we don't have to do that. We don't need to put on those shows for those folks, and we need to glorify who we are as a people. 
and relish and cherish that. And it needs to be pumped up. You know, we did it in our songs. When Smokey Robinson and, and when the Motown was happening, man, how much, how do those love songs make us feel? I mean, we got people who've got babies, got married, got a bunch of children just based on those love songs. We need those love songs. We need those love songs to be magnified. We created songs that would turn you completely around, change your day, make you want to smile, make you want to hug somebody, and make you want to have a family, make you want to do something that you maybe not, not a plan to do. But we are able to influence and inspire people with our art on another level. And by the same token, hip hop, I'm very upset with hip hop right now because these brothers got a whole stage to run a whole bunch of words. I don't care if they're rhyming or not. You got a fat beat behind your words. We can say things to make people feel better about themselves. A lot of folks can't handle this, this pandemic. They don't know what it's like to not be in a situation where they can't socialize. So they're going crazy, pent up emotions. Depression is at the top of the heap. A lot of folks don't feel good about being alone. They, they need, and we need each other. People do need each other. We feed off each other. We rejuvenate each other. We give each other, we charge each other's batteries on a lot of levels. That's got to continue. That's who we are. We are a social pe people. We're yeah. not an isolated group of people that live with rocks and, 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 and uh, other animals. We live with each other and we love each other and we go through emotional trips with each other, but they shouldn't always end up being in a nigga situation. It should be something that we can be proud of and, 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 and gain something great from. And that's, that's the mission. And it has, for me, that's always been my story. And I, I continue to do that. And I, and I know one thing, when you are around black folks and you show that love and it's sincere and they know when you're sincere and they know when you're not, man, black people will love you back. And that's the truth. Black folks have a way of showing their love for you in spite of their lack of love for themselves. If they see you really do care about them and you really show that interest and concern for their well-being, they will somehow let you know, as far as they're concerned, they care about you too. Because right. I, have been, I have been the recipient of some tremendous love for my people. I cannot, and I mean, especially my sisters. And I ain't been no angel. God knows I've violated on many levels. But my sisters have never let me down. They are constantly holding me up, constantly giving me support, constantly looking out. I've had, during this pandemic, I've had a number of sisters come here in my house with groceries, man, bringing my belt. And I reached in my pocket to give them money. I said, no, I'll be doing, I'm doing this for you because I know you don't, you don't need to go out and shop. And I, I went shopping and I bought this. And I know you like this. I know you like that. So I, I mean, please, I, the, our people are lovers. We're not militants. We're not killers. We're not haters. We're lovers. We even love our own enemy, which is a problem, of course, because he can't give us the love that we give him. And we need to just go ahead and love ourselves more and stop even trying to get his approval for what we do in our lives, because that's a problem. Trying to seek approval from somebody who doesn't even want you to exist. Mm, right. Thank you. I really appreciate that, brother. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. In this episode, we discuss the Black arts movement, the last poets, hip hop, and the role of the artists in the African Revolution with Brother Abby Odun, Oye Wooler. So, uh, Brother Abby Odun, we can't have all this uh, discussion uh, around music and, and African music um, without talking a bit about your new project. Yes, Gratitude. Yes, sir. I'm, extremely, I'm extremely proud of Gratitude because it's the very first family project, complete family project that I've ever done. Everything on Gratitude was done by them. My grandson did all the tracks. And mm -hmm. my I have a son that's a lawyer. And he would constantly tell me that my grandson had moved from North Carolina to New York. And he's my grandson by marriage because his mother, my son's, Aisha is my, my son's mother. When, she, when I met her, she had a son already. He was about 10. Now, you know, if you meet a woman and you want to get with and she's got a son, you better be friends with that son before you can get with that woman because that he's, he's gonna make a difference. 
So me and her son, Ricky, became very close. And Ricky is brilliant. He was like born with a computer in his brain. I mean, the boy is just smart. And he part, and he ended up having a job, getting a job in Research Triangle, which is the big computer center in America. And he was running an entire IBM department out of high school because he just knew computers. He must have had it in his DNA or something. I don't know where it came from, but he knew computers. Anyway, he has a son that ends up parlaying his knowledge that he got from his dad into music. So he's making this computer music. I'm not into computer music. I, I want to see a real bass, real drums, real horns. Man, that's stuff, you know, sit on a keyboard and make sounds. I'm not into that. So my son, who's a lawyer, he say, Pops, you at least got to see your grandson. He's your grandson, man. You ain't seen him since he's been here. I went over to his house. I met him and his wife, beautiful sister. I call her Smiley because of her smile is infectious, man. You, you see her smile and you start smiling. Beautiful, absolutely. A young, young couple. They were in their young 20s. But they are old souls. You could feel the age, even though they were young in terms of time now. But you knew that they had been here before. And he played some tracks, and I was blown away because the tracks sound human to me. It didn't sound like some mechanical stuff. It sounded like it had some flavor. And discovered that I could work with him. And then my son that was with me, who was a lawyer, Oba, he would pick out the poems that I would. He said, Pops, I think this poem works with that track. Because I had like my recent poetry in this red folder, and my son would look through it and pick out what he thought would fit. So I would do what he chose, and we lay it down to this track. And then, unbeknownst to me, they would send that track after I laid down the poem to my son in Texas, my oldest son, Pharaoh. And he's like a Quincy Jones of the family. He's not one thing he doesn't know in music, and he can dress up anything. I mean, he knows how to make stuff sound better. He can put the icing on any kind of cake. And he did that with all these tracks. I am so very fortunate. I've got talented folks in my family yeah. who came together to make this happen. And when I when we did it, I wasn't looking for a label or none of that other stuff. It was something that I did from my heart. Mm. I printed up some copies, got a, a photographer to take pictures. And when uh, last while I was on the road, when we were performing someplace, or if I'm lecturing someplace, I'll always have like a table of merchandise because I know if you're doing something good and people want a piece of you, you know, let them buy your books or your CDs, whatever. So that particular CD was on a table. And um, this white guy who I don't know, I mean, I didn't know him at the time and people just buy stuff. And I don't, I'm don't, i not clocking what, what kind of ethnicity you are, but you know, you're just buying my product. And it's a guy who called me up about a year after he had bought a copy of Gratitude. He says, man, I listen to this CD every day. He says, this is my favorite CD. He says, mm. he says I would like to re-release re, re it. I said, re-release it? I said, it's never been released. Uh, it, would be, <laughs> it, would be, it would be released for the first time. I said, I, I did it, but I did it as a family project, and I make it available to people, but I did it because it was like just a statement that my family was making that I was proud of. He said, man, this is the greatest CD. This is a great CD, man, and it needs to be out there. So my son, the lawyer, made a deal. We got some money up front. They made it and they hooked up. We're working on putting together the first video, which would be about Harlem because Harlem is one of the tracks. Right. I mean, right, I, right. I am so very proud of it because it does every, it, and it really, and listening to it, because I've had to listen to it, now i got to memorize the stuff because they're talking about performing some of those tracks. So I've got to make some some space in my memory bank to get some less poetry down in my head. But the fact is that when I'm going over it, listening to the CD, it expresses all of the values that I, that I hold dearly. And, and I'm very proud of it because it is a family project. It's saying exactly what my heart and soul wanted to say. And my, my, my grandson has gotten tremendous notoriety because now he's done some beats for Dre. Apple mm -hmm. heard him and they talked about hiring him because they like what he was doing. So he's got a gift for, for taking, uh, for doing uh, that. And, and it's, and it's made his life a special thing as well. So it's just a win-win situation. And, um, I'm just, I'm, and, and then my, um, my mother knew I was doing the CD with my family and I would tell her, cause I keep her abreast of everything I'm doing. And so she said, well, what do you call this new project? 
And I didn't have a name for it. I'm just doing the work. And I want to say something that would be Christian and friendly at the same time, because my mother's very much about Jesus. So I said, well, I was thinking about gratitude. And she said, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I said, there, there you go. <laughs> I didn't have to look no further for the title. So it's a complete family project that I'm extremely proud of. Yeah, I, and I really appreciate that. And, you know, you can listen to the album. You can hear the um, the family influence. You can tell or something that was put together by the entire village. Yes, by the yeah, entire um, village. You know, and one thing I was actually um, speaking to uh, Juanita about it briefly earlier. One thing I really appreciated about it was the, the whole structure of the album, like the sequence of the album. It flows real uh, coherently. Like the track list is a story in and of itself. Right, yeah. right. One, one thing I wanted to ask, um, what was the significance uh, behind placing uh, Brooklyn right after Harlem? You know what? I didn't do any of that. That was done by Oba. That was, again, the family did that. I All I did was put the tracks down. How they placed it was their decision. And it makes sense to me because I guess the same thing that you just expressed, a sense of flow. That's on point. You know, the, the final song, the final song on the album, and I think I think it might even be significant that it was the last song on the album, but uh, what I want to see, it, it sounds to me like it's a vision for a liberated Africa. And, and Yes, liberated absolutely. Africa. Yeah, brother. Yes. Yeah, so can, can you speak just a little more on, on what you want to see? Well, you know, I mean, I, I man, I'm a brother. I First of all, I have not joined your force yet. I don't have no cell phone. And the other thing is my kids would get on me all the time because my door is always unlocked. All right. I did. I, it was broken, but I didn't worry about that. Um, I don't like locks. I don't like keys. I don't want to live in a world where we have to lock up everything. I don't want to have to worry. I don't want to stress myself out worrying about somebody stealing from me. I want us to walk around dressed in integrity. I want us to be able to express love, not some kind of a made up cellophane type of phony love. I mean, I want us to be able to love each other honestly. We are making excuses for latex love. I mean, it, it really hurts my heart because I want to see us loving each other and magnifying the beauty of each other, multiplying that. We are special. And that's not any hatred. If you with, with a white person, so be it. I mean, I'm, I can't tell you to love. You love who you feel like. But learn how to appreciate loving yourself. And if you really, truly love yourself, I don't think you're going to look much further away from something that looks so much different than you. It's, it seems to be ought, when you appreciate yourself and you see that nose and them full lips and that hair and that color, why in the world would you want to dilute that? If I like my coffee black, don't give me no milk to put in it. I, give me my black coffee. Let it, I want it to be strong and hot. So make it happen. But we need we need to recognize that we are shortchanging ourselves when we skip the fence and hang out with those other folks. Yes, we can do anything. You can marry anybody. And yes, we know love doesn't have no color. So they think that's a lie. Love does have a color and we need to recognize it and we need to be able to cherish it. And once you're loving yourself, it's easier to love anyone else because you really have a grip on who you are and you're not substituting that lack of love for some fake love on the other side. Oh, 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 yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that very much. Thank, thanks for that. Now, in conclusion, um, I'd like to ask you, where can people find your new album? And if people want to know more about you and The Last Poets, if I'm correct, your website is www.thelastpoets.com. Is that correct? If people want to get in touch with me, they can. My my email is poetabiodun at yahoo.com. As I said, my phone number, I make it available. Some people say you shouldn't do that, but I do. And if and if I'm not here, I always tell people leave a message. It's old fashioned. I have a, a voicemail. And if you leave a message, I will respond because the one thing that I do believe in is being reliable. I don't want to ever be considered a brother who is not reliable. If you call on me, I want to answer the call. I will embrace my responsibility. You see, that's the first act of freedom anyway. You can't say you're free and not be responsible. If you're going to say you're free, then you've got to be responsible. Responsibility and freedom right. go hand in hand. Right. If, you're going to be, if you're going to be free, that means you're going to be responsible for your food, your clothing, and your shelter. Mm -hmm. I embrace that. Let right. me be free. 
but don't don't mess with me. Don't allow. Don't tell me you're gonna let me be free, and then you're gonna bomb my community, or you're gonna shoot me down because I'm free. No, being free is a responsibility that I'm willing to accept. So I deal with that in my day to day life, and I like to see that throughout the lives of all my brothers and sisters. And gratitude can be got on any app that's that's like putting up new music. The record company that we have dealt with, they're putting it out there big time on Spotify and and other uh, Bandcamp. Um, I don't know how many things it's out on, but it's available. It can easily be gotten. The first track on there is called Rain. And it's the only poem I've ever written dedicated to my mother and father who raised me. And they and I, I use the rain, elements of the rain, to show their personalities and who they were. And, and I know that that was like an ancestral tribute, which really propels this entire project. So without even thinking about it, I set it off right by paying respect to my ancestors. So it's a very worthy project. And I'm like everything else I do, I just want to be an example for other people to do the same thing. Right on, right on. I really want to... I really want to salute you for appearing on the show, uh, Brother Abiyo Doon. I just want to give you a deep salute, salute your contribution to revolutionary culture and just the African revolution as a whole. And um, I think I want to just, I want to quote you. You said a few minutes ago, you said, uh, I want us to walk around dressed in integrity. And um, yes. I, yeah, that really resonated with me. I know we'll, we'll, we'll only get to that point once we're free. And just the cultural work is, is a vital aspect to us getting free. So I just really want to salute you for being on the show with us well, today. Thank, well, brother, I want to salute you because you're keeping the spirit alive. When you have a communication device like a radio station, that's very important. It was important a long time ago, and it's just as important today. We're that's not it. talking to each other like we should. And we're not, when we talk, a lot of us are still having petty conversations. A lot of us are still talking nonsense and gibberish. And you have a station where people can say something of substance. You put people on here that you think can make a, a an honest contribution to, to a group of people who need some contributing to, to help them make it through this life that we have. Right. We're only here for a short while, brother. And if right anybody can help us create joy in the moment, or help us through the understanding of these moments. As far as I'm concerned, I salute you. I have a big mouth. I write poetry and all that stuff. But you've got a station where you can reach out to a lot of ears that would never hear what I have to say if you didn't have the vehicle to make it happen. So I want to thank you for having me on. And if you ever want me on again, all you got to do is contact me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll make sure we do that. And, you know, what you said is kind of um, brought to mind, you know, the slogan of Black Power 96 is not just explaining the world, but changing it. That's right. There you go. And and the change starts with each other. Once you change yourself, the world starts to change around you. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. In this episode, we discuss the last poets, Hip hop and the role of the artists in the African Revolution with Abi Odun or Iwole. You can find his album, Gratitude, wherever you listen to and purchase your music. And you can find more information about Abi Odun and The Last Poets at thelastpoets.com. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Aliki and Goma. Shout out to the Black Power Talk Show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson. Empress Livewire and the Hips of Panda. Uhuru. You can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God-